What's up, fans, friends, and followers? Andy from the Music Emporium. Dan here. We're coming at you with our fall vintage drop today. Super excited. This is a three cup of coffee energy level, if you can't tell that already. Uh, we're going to run down some of the highlights from our new fall 2022 vintage collection. <laughs> in it in total than what you see here in the video uh, if you want to fast forward right to demos or anything links are all in the descriptions listings are all in the descriptions if you'd like to hear us blather about the highlights of the show we're gonna get into that right now uh, Dan you want to kick it off with our crown jewel electric let's over do here? it yeah because to be honest when are you gonna get the opportunity to see something like this again uh, never I'm gonna go out on a limb and say I won't see another one of it these. ain't happening folks and if it is, play the lottery and don't go outside in a lightning storm. Uh, this is a 1959 Gibson ES355T. Yes, T. That's the early designation for essentially the first run of these semi-hollow instruments that were built by Gibson starting in 1958. This is an incredible example and a really rare variant at that. I won't go into too much detail as Andy mentioned. We've got plenty of information. Links are all in the description. Great content, great video, great demos. But really quickly, we'll just hit on this fact. Originally, if you ordered a 355 from Gibson in 1959, stock would have been a Bigsby with a Veritone and stereo output. This is a factory mono with a factory stop tail. So super rare configuration. It's got original double white PAFs, just an exceptional guitar. We're really fortunate to have this one here. And um, as you can imagine, it sounds fantastic, plays great, a real winner, and definitely the star of the show. So. How does it sound? Hit that link in the description you hear. Kevin Barry, the, the absolute master Kevin Barry, really putting this thing through its paces. Yeah, this is a great one. Um, on the acoustic side of things, definitely the Jewel in this collection uh, is this guy right here. 1933 Martin OM18 flat top acoustical guitar. Um, we've taken to calling this one the Pickard family guitar. It uh, was originally purchased by a gentleman named Bob Pickard whose group the Pickard family was one of the early performers on the Grand Old Opry. It's a one owner family guitar previously uncirculated, completely original just been refretted by our friend TJ Thompson. Other than that, nothing has ever been done to it. Um, it's an incredible sounding guitar, as you would probably imagine if you've ever played another 1933 Martin OM18, or any pre-war OM18 for that matter, and we won't bore you with too much poetry about the sound here. You can, again, hit the links in the description. A um, Couple of just kind of curious factors about this guitar. No decal on the peghead. Why does it not have a decal on the peghead? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> The finish is certainly completely original. The guitar is unmodified in any way. It's certainly not a case of like somebody scraped the decal off the peghead. Why would you do that anyway? If you had a Martin OM18 and you loved it, presumably you wouldn't do that. Um, I don't know. There's not a great explanation for it. This guitar is very late in the year, 1933, almost to 1934 when they changed the designation to triple O18 from OM18. I have seen other early 34s with no decal on the peghead, so maybe it was a period of time where they were just out of them and shipped guitars without them because they would do whatever it took to sell a guitar in that time period. Don't know, no great explanation, but it's original and doesn't look like any decal has ever been there. Um, also another interesting note about this guitar, the nut width is about one and 11 16 inches. Um, so it sort of dispels that, you know, rumor that like, all pre-war OMs are one and three quarter at the nut. Uh, this one is certainly not. The nut itself measures about one and 23, 30 seconds, but it's definitely under a one and three quarter fingerboard width. Doesn't really feel any different to me, um, but just kind of a curious factor. Um, and again, hit the listing for a more kind of thorough description of the guitar. And uh, it's just really, really cool to come by one of these, you know, uh, an OM18 that's never been on the market before, one owner guitar in all original, excellent condition is is definitely not something uh, we may ever see again. So, 
Link in the description if you want to find out more. Can't beat that one. Nope. Gotta pivot back to electric for a minute. Excuse my reach, but uh, we've got another really great 60s electric here. Probably one of the finest playing and sounding jazz masters we've come through the shop. Um, it's a 63 jazz master. Um, this came to us uh, from a local gentleman whose uncle owned it uh, for the better part of about 40 years and handed it down to him. Um, and in so many ways, it's player grade to, uh, to a point, but generally all of the critical components of a great 60s Fender are there. Original electronics, um, original finish, the neck is great. Um, most of the hardware here is original as well. Um, critical components like the bridge, um, the tremolo bass, and the tuners. Um, it's had a wonderful refret uh, by our friend Laurent Brondel up in Maine um, and uh, has been serviced and set up and ready to go. Again, a really fantastic example. Um, I feel like it's not every day you get a jazz master that uh, is easily uh, a guitar that can go to toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Strat or a Tele, and this one certainly ticks those boxes. So just a really cool piece. It's got some really vibe beware in all the right spots, um, but just an excellent example of, a, of a, an early 60s jazz master. So. That guard. Right? It's making me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> um, a cool acoustic to kind of echo some of the points Dan just made there. Use my reach as well. Um, is this 1962 Gibson Hummingbird? Uh, I was thinking of it when Dan was just talking about Brondale's refret and the Jazz Master and the, and the sort of like somewhat non original components of that guitar. And you know what? It doesn't matter. That guitar, the Jazz Master, is an absolutely killer guitar. If you're looking for that sound, I would argue it's maybe better after Brondale refretted it. It totally. certainly plays better. Um, and I would say many of the same things about this Hummingbird. Uh, it's a 62 Hummingbird, so somewhat of a rare beast in the sense that it's maple back and sides. You don't see many of these, period. Um, and it's the longer scale, so you could almost say like it's a dove, but it has Hummingbird on the label and a Hummingbird pick guard. Um, or you could say it's a Hummingbird with maple back and sides and a long scale, however you wanna you know, classify it, that's what it is. It's been worked on by our friend Pat DeBurro up in Exeter, New Hampshire. Fantastic luthier and guitar builder in his own right. Placed the bridge, placed the bridge plate, refretted the guitar, set the neck, fixed the big crack in the soundboard. And you know what? It doesn't matter. It does not. This thing is one of the best sounding hummingbirds we've ever heard. Everybody who has picked it up and strummed a chord would say exactly the same thing. It's almost like a joke in the shop now. Everybody who plays the guitar says, <laughs> exactly the same thing and it's one of those guitars where the sound makes you forget about everything else and if you're looking for that like you know super vibey big chunky strummy gibson rhythm guitar sound silver platter here you go you can't it, beat it it really does not get much better than this um again fantastic demo video of this with our friend rachel sumner playing a dylan tune and we'll show you exactly what you're supposed to do with a guitar like this so if you want to check that out link in the description Quick pivot, we're gonna stick with Gibson, but we're gonna go back to something with a little bit more of that history, story, and provenance. I'm gonna do a big reach here. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I'm just gonna do a, a quick pivot <laughs> like this. I've got the moves for it, so don't you worry. And man, when it comes to arch top electrics, is there anything more notable and perhaps identifiable than an ES-175? I don't think so. Um, the ultimate performer's jazz box here. This is a one owner instrument um, that came to us from a gentleman uh, whose father owned it since new, uh, ran a music school out in the Worcester area, and played this guitar his whole life, really. Um, just a fantastic instrument um, from tip to stern. An original 1962 ES-175D, D stands for double pickup. We've got two factory PAFs um, with the original sunburst finish, all original hardware, original frets. This one came in the original case with hang tags and the really rare, and I'll say it kind of in a nerdy sense, 
the pickup information sheet that got shipped with these when PAFs were still kind of in their infancy. Yeah. So really cool uh, accoutrement to support um, a really storied and classic Gibson Electric with um, really great backstory. And it's just a phenomenal example of this. Uh, our friend Kevin Barry puts this one through its paces in a demo. You'll see it in the link in the description. Fantastic sounding example. Uh, again, what else do you need if you're looking for this sound? Um, you're not going to beat it in a great 175 like this. This is one of those best of both worlds guitars. If you want the vintage guitar that's been owned by a player, loved by a player, you know, tens of thousands of hours behind the box on this one, but also is completely original. And just honestly, it looks like the kind of guitar that Gibson would put in their catalog, or if there was like a coffee table book about 175s. Right. This is the kind of guitar that would be on the cover, and it's got all the case candy and everything. Just really a complete package in every way if a 175 is what you're after. Absolutely. Yep. And the Gibson train just keeps on rolling here. If we were making a Gibson coffee table book and we wanted a J45, it would certainly be this one. This is the cleanest J45 we've ever had in the store. Sound to match. I mean, the, the joke about finding the right J45 or finding the right Gibson flat top, actually, no matter what the model, you have to play a lot of them. There's some inconsistency. They don't sound killer one to the next. Um, whatever you think of that line, we hear it all the time. And I, I think there's some truth to it, but the sound of this thing is just not to be believed if what you're after is a J45. Banner on the headstock, no banner on the headstock, it doesn't matter. This thing is just absolutely killer and gleaming clean original condition. The only thing that's been changed are the bridge pins. So, you know, that devalues at about 25% or something. <laughs> um, but just an absolutely gorgeous looking guitar. I mean, for sunburst flat tops, this is kind of a poster child. Again, a, a total coffee table Gibson book. Uh, no banner on this one. It's a 46, so script logo on the headstock. Um, big, chunky neck, hugely resonant, perfectly playable. And if you're looking for a J45, again, it won't get cleaner and more all original than this, and it has the sound to match. So Yeah, that, that lacquer is about as fresh as the day that thing was sprayed. Yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty crazy. It's right? really shocking to see a Gibson from this period in the 40s that doesn't have the finish all spiderweb to heck all over the top of the guitar. I mean, there's certainly some crazing on it, as you would expect to see from any 70-plus-year-old guitar that's been hanging around for a long time, but... I've never seen a J45 this clean, probably won't ever see one again. Definitely looks like the kind of guitar that was in a case in somebody's closet for a couple of decades, but if what you're after is a J40 sound, cleanliness, originality, sound, you won't find a more complete package than this one. And again, if you want to hear it, link is in the description. Cool. We're going to touch on a couple more Gibsons here. Well, I should say a Gibson and a guitar made by Gibson. It doesn't say Gibson on the headstock. I'm going to grab passes. these. Oh, yeah. Got a beautiful little side-by-side -side right here. Yes, we do. And again, another um, instance where we're really fortunate to have two kind of iconic mid-60s Gibsons um, that are essentially the same instrument, but uh, with a different brand. Um, in my hand, I've got a 1965 Gibson ES330 and the factory cherry finish. So uh, this is a fully hollow, um, thin line, ar arch top electric with dual P90s, uh, standard Gibson scale length and accoutrement here. Um, pretty run of the mill, um, you know, instrument um, for this time period. Uh, 330s were, were hugely popular um, ever since their inception in 1959. And um, just a great all around example, really clean, um, this one's uh, early enough in 65 where it's got the wide nut, which everybody seems to like and prefer. Um, but to my right, in an Andy's hand, is an equally fantastic and clean Epiphone Casino. Essentially, the same guitar as an ES330 in almost every way. Um, primarily, the, the differences are going to be aesthetics and what it says on the headstock. Um, but just another great example of what a great thin line arch top hollow body sounds like. Again, dual P90s. All of these instruments here, any Gibson or Epiphone you see from this period, they're essentially built alongside each other. 
uh, and they, they're outfitted with the same hardware. Um, Gibsons were using um, ABR, ABR bridges and trapeze tailpieces. Same with the Epiphones. Same exact hardware, same electronics, same plastics even. So really a, a cool way to look at what you can see are very minimal differences between the two models, even though they, they are different models. So. Yeah. Ostensibly the exact same guitar, plywood body. So it does get you thinking, like, how different should they be? And that was really the most eye-opening thing about recording them side to side, same rig, same player, same all of that. They're very different sounding guitars. Totally. So it's it's kind of the ultimate proof that like you really do need to judge them as individuals no matter you know how many labels you can apply to something sometimes a, a certain instrument just has it and that was really kind of the revelatory thing about hearing Kevin play these two side by side right right and play them he did <laughs> really puts them into a place I think we all understand what these guitars are capable of doing and historically what they've been um, kind of uh, referenced as and, and, and associated with from, from a player standpoint um, but in the hands of a great guitar player you can learn to understand how much more capable and versatile uh, these instruments can be. They can go from your kind of um, traditional jazz, blues, Motown, R&B sound to indie rock, rock and roll uh, with ease. I mean, there's, there's really nothing this guitar can't do except stand five feet from it uh, in front of a Marshall 412 <laughs> stack at ear splitting volumes. It's not gonna hold up too well to all that volume, but otherwise, man, these are killer sounding guitars, two really great examples, sonically, aesthetically, the whole bag. Next time I'm standing in front of a Marshall 4x12 half stack, I'll play my SG, I won't play it. There you go, yeah. right. Um, we're going to kind of wind it down now, wrap it up on the acoustic side of the collection. We have a couple more pieces that aren't in the video, uh, but certainly, again, if you want to see them, links are in the description. Really, really clean script logo, 1946 Gibson LG2. Uh, we have an old Kalamazoo KG31 archtop guitar, which is unquestionably the cleanest one of those we've ever seen. Um, maybe not the most versatile array of sounds in the world, but if you're in the <laughs> if in the mood for uh, an acoustic archtop, uh, the, it's, it's just a killer sounding guitar with, with all kinds of vibe to spare. And uh, Dan, I know we got a lot more amps and, and uh, some other guitars and stuff too. Yeah, we do. And as you can see in the, in the shot here, we've got some really great um, and equally rare examples of some cool early 60s fender combos we've got a blonde or white um, twin that's a pretty rare amp 62 super um, really cool mid 60s gretsch and an early 60s epiphone amp and a couple of cool echo plexes we've got an sg junior the list goes on links are all in the description fantastic demos of all of this uh great inventory is is uh linked below so definitely check it out yeah and for a lot of those demos we are hearing kevin play the guitars through the the brown face super and the twins so those, those are heavily featured in there as well correct yeah we did have our friends uh rich Hinman and adam lovely come in and also uh showcase a couple of these pieces they just were, they were begging for for more content really great guitars and amps so we've got some other uh, videos we're going to be putting out as well to support some of the vintage stuff so uh guys can't thank you enough for tuning in today if you're digging this content if you're as nerdy about vintage guitars as we are, we would love to have your support. Please hit the subscribe button, leave a like on the video. It really does help us out. Um, you can follow us on Instagram as well for some kind of first looks for some of this stuff if, if you're looking for vintage instruments. And please feel free to reach out to us anytime. There's nothing we like better than to nerd out about vintage guitars. So until next time, peace and thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching.